Hello, and thank you for joining us for part one of our series, Evaluating Ecosystem Services with Remote Sensing. My name is Amber McCollum, and I'm joined by my colleague Juan Torres Perez for this session. And looking forward to our many uh, guest speakers that we'll be having throughout this series in sessions two and three. For this training, we have three sessions, each one being an hour and a half long. So the first session is right now on August 23rd. Our second session will be the 26th on Thursday, and our final session will be on August 30th. Each session um, occurs at the same time um, from 11 to 1230 Eastern. And um, all of the webinar recordings, the PowerPoint presentations, and the homework assignment um, will eventually be found at the course website shown here. At the end of each session, we will have a um, question and answer session where we will display your questions and transcribe the answers on a document. And we'll make that document also available after each session. Um, if you have additional questions that we don't get to today, you can email myself or my colleague Juan at our email addresses shown here. And we're so excited to have um, participants from all around the world with us today. It's a really great group. Um, and so um, please do introduce yourself um, if you'd like, and also ask your questions along the way. Um, and we'll be cataloging those for the end of the session today. For this training series, there is one homework assignment um, to complete the course and you'll submit that via Google form. The link for the homework is not available yet, but will be available um, during our final session on August 30th. Um, you will then have two weeks to complete the homework and the deadline for the homework is um, September 13th. To obtain a certificate of completion, you will need to attend all three of the live webinars and submit the homework assignment by the deadline. If you attend all the sessions and complete the homework, you will receive your certificate within about two months after the completion of the course. So do please um, be patient with us as we get all of those out to you all. Keep in mind that this is an introductory course, but we do re recommend having some kind of background of what remote sensing is. So we have our prerequisite here, the fundamentals of remote sensing listed. And then again, our um, course website there as well. I would like to remind our participants, if you're new to the RCEP program, um, we are here under the capacity building program at NASA, um, which is under the Applied Sciences program. And the purpose of NASA RCET is to help build the skills and uh, to acquire and use NASA satellite data for decision support. So we have trainings like this and many other trainings in different application areas like water resources, air quality, disasters, new trainings in climate, and um, many, many areas. So please do um, take a look at our website for other trainings that may be of interest to you as well. So for this session, we hope that you'll be better able to understand what ecosystem services are, how they are valued, what are the primary global frameworks and initiatives for assessing the value of ecosystems, and then really what is the role of remote sensing in these evaluations and what kinds of data and products are available for remote sensing um, of these um, aspects. In the next two sessions, we will then highlight more specifically models for conducting ecosystem assessments and also provide some use case examples from projects around the world in session three. So given that um, we are just introducing this concept, let's start with an overview of ecosystem services. 
The natural world enriches our lives in many ways, and there are tangible benefits to living in a world with healthy ecosystems. The value of nature to people has long been recognized, but in recent years, the concept of ecosystem services has been developed to describe these various benefits. An ecosystem service is any positive benefit that wildlife or ecosystems provide to people. We have a stronger economy, diverse food products, and advancements in medical research as a result of wildlife and natural ecosystems. Ecosystem services are generally categorized into provisioning, cultural, regulating, and supporting. A provisioning service is any type of benefit to people that can be extracted from nature, along with food, such as fruits, vegetables, fish, livestock. Other types of provisioning services include drinking water, timber, wood fuel, natural gas, oils, plants, um, and things that can be made into clothes or provide medical benefits. A regulating service is the benefit provided by an ecosystem process that moderate natural phenomena. Regulating services include things like pollination, decomposition, water purification, erosion and flood control, and carbon storage and climate regulation. All of these processes work together to make ecosystems clean, sustainable, functional, and resilient to change. As we interact and alter nature, the natural world in turn alters us. It has guided our cultural, intellectual, and social development by being a constant um, presence in our lives. A cultural service is a non-material benefit that contributes to the development and cultural advancement of people, including how ecosystems play a role in local, national, and global cultures. The building of knowledge and the spreading of these ideas, creativity born from interactions with nature, such as music, art, architecture, and recreation. Supporting services are the underlying processes that support the most fundamental of ecosystem functions. These include things like photosynthesis, nutrient cycling, the creation of soils, and the water cycle. These processes allow the earth to sustain basic life forms. Without the supporting services, the provisional, regulating, and cultural services wouldn't exist. This figure from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which we will describe in subsequent slides, depicts the strength of linkages between categories of ecosystem services and components of human well being that are commonly encountered and includes indications of the extent to which it is possible for socioeconomic factors to mediate the linkage. So here you can see how cultural services can positively impact our health and social relations, for example. Changes in ecosystems can negatively or positively affect human well-being. For example, population, technology, and lifestyle can lead to changes in biodiversity which in turn can affect things like fish stocks or the amount of fertilizer applied to crops. These interactions are complex and can take many spatial and temporal scales. For example, an international demand for timber may lead to a regional loss of forest cover, which increases flood magnitude along a local stretch of river. Therefore, understanding and accounting for these complex interconnected changes to ecosystems can be extremely challenging. In order to better understand this landscape, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was conducted in 2005, which included over 1,300 scientists from 95 countries. The assessment focused on the linkages between ecosystems and human well being, and in particular, the focus for this series, Ecosystem Services. This deals with a full range of ecosystems, from those relatively undisturbed, such as natural forests, to landscapes with mixed patterns of human use, to ecosystems intensively uh, managed and modified by humans, 
such as agricultural or urban areas. This really provided a comprehensive guide to the changes that are occurring in our ecosystems, as well as the actions needed to enhance conservation and the sustainable use of ecosystems. Um, this report also addressed four international conventions, which are shown here, and really led to a lot of the efforts that I will um, speak to in this series. So the MEA set out to address five primary questions. What are the current conditions and trends of ecosystems, ecosystem services, and human well-being? What are the plausible future changes in these ecosystems and human well-being? What can be done to enhance well-being and conserve ecosystems? What are the key uncertainties that hinder decision-making? What tools and methodologies developed and used can strengthen our capacity to assess ecosystems, their services, and their impact on humans? And here is really the key piece where Earth observations can play a role. So to briefly review some of the other major findings of the MEA, over the past 50 years, humans have changed ecosystems more rapidly and extensively than in any other comparable period of time in human history. And that might not come to a surprise, um, come as a surprise to you all. Um, and this has been done largely to meet growing demand for things like food, fresh water, timber, fiber, and fuel. And it has resulted in a substantial loss of diversity um, of life on Earth. The changes that have been made to ecosystems have contributed to substantial net gains in human well being and economic development. But these gains have been achieved at growing costs in the form of degradation to ecosystems. And this can be um, exacerbated by um, nonlinear changes in our ecosystems, um, including changes related to climate change. Also, in most countries, the marketed value of ecosystems associated with timber and fuel, or fuel wood production are less than one third of the total economic value, um, including non-marketed values such as carbon sequestration, watershed protection, and recreation. The MEA also found that the degradation of ecosystem services could grow significantly worse during the first half of this century and serve as a barrier to achieving things like the sustainable development goals. This figure outlines an example in regards to the collapse and forced closure of a fishery after 100 years of use. Until the late 1950s, the fishery was used by migratory seasonal fleets and resident, resident inshore small scale farmers. From the late 1950s, offshore bottom trawlers then began exploiting the deeper parts of the stock, which led to an increase in catch but also a decline in the biomass. And as you can see here, there was a um, collapse in the stock in the early 80s and 90s, um, and policies that were put in place around these to um, try to address these issues. However, the, this um, fishery example um, was unable to um, come back from this this major decline and was closed indefinitely in 2003. This highlights the challenge of um, reversing the degradation to our ecosystems while also meeting the increasing demand for their services um, for human use. So many options exist to conserve or enhance ecosystem services in a way that can reduce these sort of negative trade-offs um, and the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment outlined these uh, various scenarios in which we can address these issues and move forward. So the first is global orchestration, which um, depicts a globally co connected society in which policy reforms uh, focus on global trade and economic liberalization um, and are really able to allow for equitable participation um, across goods and services. 
And I would say that we're making some good progress in this direction, and I'll highlight some of these um, global and regional efforts to work together towards meeting some of these goals. Um, some of these others, um, the other scenarios include order from strengths, um, ad the adapting mosaic, um, and the techno garden scenario. And you can read much more about all of these scenarios in the Millennial Eco Ecosystem Assessment. Um, but these are all uh, ways in which we can work together to help solve these kinds of issues of degradation and loss. And um, we'll be really focusing on the ability for technology to provide us with information about our ecosystems to help shape our policy decisions. Okay, so now that we've defined ecosystem services and some of the outcomes from the Millennio Ecosystem Assessment, let's now focus on how ecosystems can be valued. Ecosystem service valuation is the term for the process of quantifying the value of ecosystem service benefits to people provided by a given landscape or habitat type in a defined location. While it's common to value the benefits in terms of dollars, other units of measurement can be used, such as the measures of human well-being. Um, the key to, to all of this is that the units can allow for comparison of preferences when making decisions about the allocation of scarce resources. Ecosystem valuation can be difficult and controversial. However, agencies in charge of protecting and managing natural resources must often make difficult uh, spending decisions that involve trade-offs and allocating resources. These types of decisions are economic and thus are based either explicitly or implicitly on society's values. Therefore, economic valuation can be really useful and can provide a way to justify or set priorities for programs, policies, or actions to protect or restore ecosystems and their services. And because this is so difficult, we really must recognize the challenges and uncertainties um, involved in this process. And it's really important when conducting an evaluation to define the purpose and the inherent trade-offs that are made in that valuation. It's also really important to recognize indigenous communities that already have value systems in place that may or may not align with the way in which um, economic valuation is conducted. Um, and so a lot of uh, values might extend beyond this market-based approach. So as I mentioned, valuation can be economic or non-economic. Economic or monetary valuations are developed within specific decision contexts. For starters, almost no, if any proponent of valuation uh, believes that economic considerations are the only reason to preserve the natural world. Um, there are ethical and other considerations um, concerning humans' relationship to nature that go beyond uh, the realm of economic analysis. But within the framework of economics, monetary valuations can be limited. Valuations can provide an estimate of the economic value of a limited number of services at a particular time. Despite the limitations, monetary valuation can help the preservation of nature on an equal footing with its development, thereby helping decision makers more clearly understand the trade-off. For a more comprehensive guide to types of economic valuation, that we won't get into in this training series. You can see this, um, this paper here um, that I've linked in the slide um, that highlights total economic value framework. When conducting economic ecosystem evaluation, the term natural capital is often used, and we will use that throughout this training series. This describes the natural assets in the world around us such as plants, rivers, soils, and animals. Thus, ecosystem services describe the flow of benefits which we gain from this natural capital. For example, a woodland is a natural capital asset 
from which the ecosystem service of supplying wood fuel, reducing water runoff, and providing a peaceful retreat can be gained. The term natural capital is attributed to um, an economist in 1973 that wrote a book, Small is Beautiful. And um, I will say that there are many definitions of this term. The concept of natural capital does extend beyond nature as a source of raw materials for production. And this is included in the role of the environment and ecosystems in supporting human well being in the supply of the goods and services. Natural capital accounting, or NCA, is an umbrella term that covers the effect, that covering efforts used in um, accounting frameworks to provide a systematic way to measure and report the stocks and flows of natural capital. Its underlying premise is that since the environment is important to society and the economy, it should be recognized as an asset that must be maintained and managed and its contrib contributions or services um, can be better integrated into commonly used frameworks like the system of nat national accounts. NCA covers accounting for individual environmental assets or resources, both biotic and abiotic. And the system of environmental economic accounting or SIA is the accepted international standard for doing this type of accounting. And we will talk about that um, in much more depth in subsequent slides. So here, the source of income and well-being is considered the total wealth. It's broadly defined to include manufactured capital, natural capital, and intangible capital. The NCA focuses on this part of total wealth that comes from mineral, energy, agricultural, soil, timber, and water assets. And um, such categorizes those as natural capital. So it's one piece in this larger um, consideration of total wealth. So there are many benefits to natural capital accounting. The value of natural capital or the valuation of ecosystem services, identifies and estimate, estimates the source of the services that nature provides. When climate change, overpopulation, or pollution threatens nature, societies and economies are also threatened. If governments can better account for nature's role in the economy and well-being, they can create tools to sustain that natural capital while promoting growth and decreasing poverty. Okay, so given that we've set the groundwork, we've provided this framework for ecosystem services and natural capital, let's review some global frameworks that are used in conducting these valuations. So I mentioned the UN System of Environmental Economic Accounting, or SIA, and this is the internationally accepted statistical framework to measure the environment and its interactions with the economy and as such is the fundamental planning policy tool for national governments aspiring towards sustainable development. The SIA produces integrated information by taking basic economic, environmental, and social data and translating them into accounts, which in turn produces nationally recognized indicators. And this includes global reporting uh, for various conventions like the SDGs, um, which is a priority of the Group on Earth Observations, or GEO, which I'll mention in a moment as well. Currently, SIA supports multiple indicators for over 50 countries to assist in the de development of these experimental ecosystem accounts. So SIA includes two parts, the central framework, which was adopted as the statistical standard um, in 2012, and the Experimental Ecosystem Accounts, or the EEA framework, which was published in 2014. So the central framework measures emissions, stocks, and uses of individual natural resources and transactions related to environmental management. The EEA, or the Experimental Ecosystem Accounts, 
provides a framework for measuring ecosystems and, use, and their uses and recognizes that ecosystems generate multiple types of services. So those things like provisioning, regulating cultural services they mentioned earlier. So um, this ecosystem, these ecosystem accounts primarily use maps for analysis and reporting. And this is really where Earth observations can play a key, key role. So to speak about these ecosystem accounts in a bit more depth, the goal is to assess ecosystems and link the services they provide to economic and other human activity by providing national governments with statistical information on their value and how that might lead to more effective natural resources decisions. So broadly speaking, um, these types of accounts can be divided into two primary components, physical accounts and monetary accounts. Physical accounts seek to quantify the extent and conditions of ecosystems, often referred to as the stock, and the supply and the use of services provided. The monetary accounts used in this information um, provide information of the flow of the ecosystem services to derive the monetary value within the economy. So given the usefulness of generating ecosystem accounts, SIA has an integrated data and comprehensive statistical framework for organizing and reporting these kinds of data. This is a spatially based integrated statistical framework for organizing biophysical information about ecosystems and helps us measure ecosystem services and track changes in the extent and condition, thus valuing ecosystem services and assets and linking this information to the economy. So the CIA EA was developed by a multi multidisciplinary group of experts to respond to a range of policy demands and challenges with a focus on making visible contributions of nature to the economy and people. To this end, ecosystem accounting incorporates a wider range of benefits um, to people that, that then can be captured in standard economic accounts. So here, the CIA EA really takes the spatial approach to accounting as the benefits a society receives from ecosystems really depend on where those assets are in the in the landscape and your relation to those that be, those benefits. Um, so again, this this really gets back to that spatial approach, that role of Earth observations. Um, so the spatial focus identifies the location and size of ecosystem assets, their services, and then the location of the beneficiaries. For example. The beneficiaries of water filtration are likely located downstream of the ecosystem asset that provides that benefit. As a result, ecosystem accounts are commonly presented using maps that bring together the geographical, environmental, ecological, and economic information in one place, or with a, a variety of maps that display these types of information. So the components of this type of analysis are um, building things that, that um, help us understand ecosystem extent, which are accounts that record the total area of each ecosystem classified by type within a specific area. And these are measured over time. They could also be ecosystem condition accounts that record the condition of the ecosystem assets in terms of selected characteristics at specific points in time. So this can measure also the change in the condition throughout time. We can also evaluate the physical and monetary ecosystem services flow accounts that record the supply of ecosystem services by ecosystem assets and, use it, and the use of those services by economic units, so things like um, household units. And then um, finally, the monetary ecosystem 
asset accounts record information on stocks and changes in stocks of ecosystem assets, including degradation and enhancement of ecosystems. So this figure depicts the relationship between these accounts and the data and tools used in support of them. In this series, we're really focused on an overview of the examples and how the tools and supporting data are generated. And really, you know, again, going back to that role of remote sensing here. Um, and this figure is also from a report on experimental ecosystem accounts from Uganda. And we will highlight um, that project and work in session three. So um, stay tuned for that as well. As of 2020, um, the, the accounts have been published in 24 countries, and those of which you can see in the figure here. These accounts are already um, informing various natural resource management decisions. For example, the Netherlands, um, their accounts showed that uh, peat areas used for, dry, for dairy farming and the combined cost of maintaining infrastructure and controlling water levels and carbon dioxide emissions considerably exceeded farmers' process, profit. So this led to new policies aimed at reducing drainage and peatlands and converting farmland back to natural ecosystems. So given all of this, there are many challenges and opportunities to the use of experimental ecosystem accounts. And some of the challenges include the high variability in scope and level of spatial data. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the, the requirement of the need for a lot of different data um, and the use of multiple models can be challenging. The data may be in an incompatible format or there may be reluctance to use it or share it. Uh, there are different measurement approaches um, compared to other systems. Um, there are different measurement approaches across countries and regions. Um, ecosystem diversity makes the selection of condition and uh, biodiversity indicators challenging. Um, the, uh, many of the current EAs don't include ecosystem resilience or probabilities for ecosystem collapse from overuse. And they, when conducted, they reflect current pricing and current markets. However, there are opportunities um, and, and I think uh, many pathways for moving forward on this type of work. Um, and these include the adoption of standards that can be used. Um, we mentioned um, the um, CIA uh, accounting framework. Um, there are also a, a growing network of um, groups and initiatives such as the group on earth observation or geo which focus on these kinds of topics and um, I would really say that the ability to use large data sets um, such as remote sensing data sets when, within a cloud computing software like Google Earth Engine and others has really um, advanced our ability to use many um, large data sets and conduct analysis over or large regions as well. And um, there is more comprehensive and high resolution analysis being conducted for these reporting purposes. So given this, I wanted to briefly mention um, a few initiatives here. Um, the first being the Group on Earth Observations or GEO, which is a global network connecting government institutions, academic and research institutions, data providers, businesses, engineers, and scientists to create innovative solutions to global challenges, um, including the challenge of conducting ecosystem assessments and preserving um, nature. Together, the GEO community um, is creating a global Earth observation system of systems, or GEOS, to better integrate observing systems and share data by connecting existing infrastructures using common stat standards. Um, so there are over 400 million open data resources available um, within GEOS and um, more than 150 national and regional providers, those like NASA and ESA, as well as international organizations like the um, 
like WMO or commercial um, groups like Digital Globe that are um, engaging in this group. So the GEOS, GEOS portal offers a single access point for users that are seeking data, imagery, and software packages relevant to many parts around the globe. So it connects users and existing databases and provides up-to-date and user-friendly information that can be useful for this type of work in accounting. This is implemented and operated by the European Space Agency, or ESA, um, and is really connected to many of these efforts um, globally. And we'll highlight some other um, tools that you can use for um, this type of analysis as well throughout this training series. A specific effort within GEO is focused on Earth Observations for Ecosystem Accounting, or EO4EA. This effort focuses on enabling the use of EO data to measure the true value of the ecosystems that can be incorporated into decision making. And these projects and teams are working to document, pioneer, develop, and test methods and tools that will, will allow Earth observation technology to more effectively enable widespread adoption of ecosystem accounting. So the EO4EA technical activities are divided into four work streams, um, which mirror the structure of the accounts and the corresponding use of Earth observations. And these are case studies and synthesis, ecosystem extent and condition, identification, measurement, and monitoring of ecosystem services, and implementation and capacity building. Um, the case studies and synthesis work stream delivers reports that highlight applications of ecosystem accounting. And we'll provide an example of this um, during our use case uh, session in session three. So stay tuned for that as well. The ecosystem extent and conditions work stream is focused on developing and testing methods for delineating ecosystem extent and condition. The ecosystem service work stream is working to advance service um, identification, measurement, and monitoring through the use of um, Earth observations. And then finally, this implementation and capacity is really focused on testing and implementing um, the accounting at a subnational and national scale. Another large scale effort related to ecosystem accounting is the Gaborone Declaration for Sustainability in Africa, or GDSA. This is an effort centered around the role of natural capital in development by bringing the value of natural resources from the periphery to the center of economic decision making. And you can see um, with the figure here, um, the countries that are currently involved in this effort. So here are a few of the goals of GDSA um, that include countries must integrate the value of nature into their national policies and programs. Countries must reduce poverty by transitioning agriculture, extractive industries, fisheries, and other economic uses of nature to practices that pr promote sustainable employment, food security, energy, and protection of nature. That countries must build the knowledge, capacity, and policy networks to promote leadership and a new model in the field of sustainable development. And as with some of these other global initiatives and regional initiatives I've mentioned, we'll present another use case example um, related to this in session three. And as we will outline in more depth in session three, Conservation International, or CI, plays an integral role in GDSA. And that includes things like outreach and communications to countries and partners, a framework for implementation, funding opportunities to do this work, um, support of the development of projects and monitoring, and promotion of success to encourage further efforts um, to engage in this work um, and 
um, to really value uh, nature for this economic and social development. Um, and then you can learn more about this partnership at the link shown here at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so the final effort that I wanted to highlight here um, is the Wealth Accounting and Valuation of Ecosystem Services, or WAVE. And this is a World Bank-led global partnership that promotes sustainable development uh, by ensuring natural resources are maintained in the development planning and national economic accounts. So this is part of um, a broader World Bank um, initiative, the Global Program for Sustainability. So some of the objectives of WAVES include to help countries adopt and implement accounts that are relevant for policies and compile a, a body of experience, to develop approaches to ecosystem accounting methodology, to establish a global platform for training and knowledge sharing, to build international consensus around natural capital accounting. And WAVES is engaged with many countries. I've listed just a few here. Um, but there are many more, and you can learn all about WAVE um, from the link provided on the previous slide as well. Okay, so now that we've laid the groundwork for what ecosystem services are and what natural capital accounting is and some of the global initiatives aimed to increase these efforts, let's talk about remote sensing and the usefulness of remote sensing within these uh, efforts and frameworks for valuing ecosystem services. So these types of data are important and useful tools for rapid assessment of ecosystem priorities and the functions as they provide this synoptic view of the Earth's surface. They can provide regular and repeatable observations over multi-annual time periods and are highly cost effective for monitoring, especially monitoring in remote and inaccessible areas. So the use of this type of data has become really widespread in these types of um, assessments. And in this regard, the spatial mapping of ecosystem extent, conditions, and services, and use is fundamental in the generation of ecosystem accounts. These three themes of extent, condition, and services are the core biophysical accounts established by the CAE framework, which we discussed previously. So therefore, there's this really significant potential to um, use EO data to address the requirements for biophysical ecosystem accounting. To date, a number of different mapping methodologies have, have been developed to support the compilation of these kinds of accounts. And we'll provide a lot of examples of, about that um, throughout this series. So remote sensing data can provide this insight into many parameters, such as elevation, precipitation, primary productivity, woody biomass, and more. And we'll talk about those moving forward. So these types of parameters can be collected using Earth observation approaches for different time periods. And these can be integrated with land cover or, or ecosystem extent data to support the compilation of ecosystem condition accounts and provide useful input for estimating and modeling ecosystem service supply and use accounts. And so this schematic here uh, gives a really nice an example of how the satellites can be used to estimate many of these parameters um, that are then incorporated into valuing the services um, in a variety of different ways. So it really um, nicely links many of these concepts together. So given this, Let's briefly review some of the satellites and sensors that are used for this type of monitoring, such as Landsat and Sentinel-2. And I will say here that this is not an exhaustive list. There are plenty of other um, satellite and airborne sensors that are being used. 
Um, but this at least provides a, a baseline of some of the most commonly used um, data sources. So you probably all have heard of Landsat. It's probably the most popular satellite um, created, series of satellites created by um, NASA and data hosted by USGS. Um, it was the first iteration was launched in the early 1970s. Um, and currently we now have um, Landsat 9 um, up in operation as well. So all of these data are freely available by the USGS. Um, they provide data um, spatially at 30 meters and have a revisit time of every 16 days. But uh, currently with multiple Landsats in orbit, we're able to obtain imagery on shorter um, cadence. Sentinel-2 is really similar to Landsat in a lot of ways. Um, it does have an improved spatial resolution of 10 to 20 meters for the visible and near-infrared. It also has a shorter revisit time of about every five days. Um, and Sentinel-2 was um, launched by ESA. It's one of their flagship um, satellites as well. And there has been a lot of work being done currently to harmonize Sentinel-2 and Landsat data. And I provided a link here um, for more information on that. MODIS is also one of the key imaging instruments for, for NASA. Um, it's really designed to measure large scale global dynamics. Um, the MODIS sensors are flying on two different satellites, Terra and Aqua, which allows us to um, obtain imagery on the same place on Earth about once a day. Um, however, the, the spatial resolution is coarser than um, things like Landsat and Sentinel, um, but here's some of the information of MODIS. And MODIS has been around for a really long time um, and provided us information um, all the way back to 2000. So the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer, or VIRS, is um, very similar to MODIS. It's sort of like a follow-on to MODIS but it has a few extra and updated aspects. These data are available from 2012 to present, a slightly improved spatial resolution compared to MODIS, and it can be useful for um, many of the similar types of mapping that is done with MODIS, so things like looking at vegetation health. Much work has been done um, to smooth the transition from MODIS to VIRS, so I've mentioned um, some of the um, comparisons between each of these here um, and some of their differences. Um, but, but VIRS is being used um, really uh, readily by the, the scientific and decision-making community now. The Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer, or AVHRR, is operated by NOAA, and there are multiple instruments on board the POSE satellite. The, re the spatial resolution is, is actually sort of coarse for AVHRR, but the high resolution aspect really refers to its temporal resolution because of their revisit time. Um, so we're able to get um, global coverage twice a day in the morning and the afternoon. Um, and so like MODIS and VIRS, AVHRR is really useful for things that are quickly changing on the landscape or for global monitoring of things like vegetation changes. I also briefly wanted to mention SPOT and MARIS. SPOT data offered by the French Space Agency has visible and near-infrared bands and has a, high, a pretty high spatial resolution of six meters with a fairly frequent revisit time. And then uh, MARIS acquires multispectral imagery of the Earth and can also be used for things like land cover mapping. Um, and you can get more information on these, um, these systems here on the slide. Hyperion is um, a really popular hyperspectral system. It was launched in 2000, but was decommissioned in 2017. So it's not actively taking data. Um, however, um, this, these types of data are really useful especially when um, thinking about identifying different types of vegetation, which you really need that hyperspectral data for. Um, and they're 
there's a lot of effort um, ongoing within NASA right now to uh, create future missions that will have hyperspectral data for these types of things. So um, it has some really great uh, data available um, in the past and can be really useful. Uh, we also have a previous RSET training um, on the use of hyperspectral data. If you're interested in that, you can refer back to our website and do a quick search of that as well. And while we'll, we won't cover this in much depth, um, LIDAR and radar data is really use, can be really useful for um, identifying things like canopy structure, um, carbon, woody biomass. Um, and currently, the only um, Sentinel-1 SAR data is operational and freely available, provided by ESA again. There are historic SAR data sets like um, PALSAR, um, and there are also upcoming SAR satellite missions, um, such as Biomass from ESA and NISAR um, from NASA that'll be coming into the future. And I will say that, again, RSET has many, many trainings on the use of SAR data um, for a variety of applications, including one on forest monitoring. Um, so you can check back on our website and um, find out much more information um, there. So now that we've provided a brief overview of some of the um, satellites and sensors that can be used, let's talk about products that are available um, for access from these satellites and sensors um, that you can use for ecosystem uh, assessment. One of the most important aspects of understanding ecosystems for accounting purposes is the generation of land cover maps for ecosystem extent and change. We will describe a few products for this, but I also want to mention and highlight the usefulness of generating your own land cover maps for these purposes. Additional variables that can be used in accounting include things like understanding vegetation health or phenological patterns through the use of indices like the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, the leaf surface area, net primary productivity, or NPP. And then, as I mentioned, for ecosystem structure, LIDAR and SAR data is really, really useful. Um, we will mention one product available related to this for boreal forests, um, but much of that work um, requires analysis conducted on your own, and there aren't as many um, freely available products available for that. So as I mentioned, land cover mapping is really key to identifying ecosystem type, extent, and changes over time. Land cover classification is the process of grouping spectral classes and assigning them informational classes. So spectral classes are groups of pixel, pixels um, with respect to their uh, that are uniform with respect to their pixel values in multiple spectral bands. And the information classes are then the categories of interest to the user. So things like water, forest, urban, agriculture. So it's important to note that these informational classes will vary depending on the region and the needs of the user. So here's a land cover classification you might be familiar with. This is the USGS National Land Cover Database that uses the 30 meter pixel Landsat data to provide these classifications for the US. Um, and that can be a great place to start if you're um, looking for examples. So I will mention a few global and regional land cover maps in subsequent slides. But again, I wanted to highlight this, uh, the opportunity and the usefulness of creating your own land cover map because you will have the local data and knowledge and you will know what types of information classes will be useful. Um, and land cover mapping can be conducted in a variety of different um, software with many different tools. And we have a lot of resources available for you um, for land cover mapping. So doing this in Google Earth Engine, uh, running accuracy assessments, and so on and so forth. So please refer to our past RSET trainings for more information on this. If you're not interested in creating your own land cover map, there are products available. 
Um, here is a MODIS yearly land cover product that incorporates six different classification schemes and describes land cover properties um, over the year. So the data are available yearly. They have a spatial resolution of 500 meters, and they're currently available from years 2001 to 2019. And you can download the, um, these products from NASA's Earth Data website that's shown um, at the bottom of the slide here. For US-based US assessments, there's also a product called the Multi-Resolution Land Characteristics, or MRLC. Um, and here is a place where federal agencies generate consistent and relevant land cover information. Um, these include things like the National Land Cover Database and others. Um, here you can see the 2019 land cover layer, and you can go in and access um, these data um, on your own here and take a look at them visually, subset for the area of interest, and also get other products like the percent tree canopy or the impervious descriptor. Uh, ESA also has, um, also produces land cover maps and via their climate change initiative, they have global land cover maps from 1992 to 2019 at, um, at a spatial resolution of 300 meters. So they also have um, maps covering five-year time periods. So for example, 2008 to 2012 um, is, is one of the more recent um, time periods. So you can download the data for those um, time periods as well. And these maps were produced using multiple sensors um, and some of those being Maris and Spot, which I mentioned earlier. And you can access these data at the link shown here. Many of the European land accounts are also based on the Copernicus Korean land cover data sets. And these are available for the years 2000, 2006, 2012, and 2018. Um, they also have status layers for a given reference year and use the mapping units of 25 hectares. Um, but the change data sets capture changes at five hectares. Um, the, this data set has 44 classes and the number of potential unique land cover changes between two observations is, is large. So you can group them into change categories known as land cover flows, um, which provide really transparent assessments. Um, and um, you can look at land cover change over time, which is really fantastic here. They use multiple different data sets like Landsat, Spot, and Sentinel-2 and you can um, take a look and access these data here on this link. So now that we've provided some of the land cover examples, let's briefly discuss some of the other variables that can be used and really important for monitoring ecosystems. So land surface phenology, or the timing of reoccurring plant and animal life stages, can also be related to environmental conditions especially when thinking about changes to the timing of green up or um, senescence throughout the year and how that might um, relate to changes in the health of an ecosystem. Again, we have an entire training devoted to phenology um, and the link to that training is listed here for more information. I briefly mentioned the normalized difference vegetation index. So many of you are probably familiar with this. It's one of the most widely used land surface parameters for monitoring vegetation health and phenological shifts. So it's based on this ratio of the near infrared to the red, um, where vegetation is, healthy vegetation strongly absorbs the red portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and strongly reflects in the near infrared. So using this ratio, you can um, identify healthy versus um, non-healthy vegetation. Similarly, there are other indices like the Enhanced Vegetation Index, or the EVI, that is um, very similar to NDVI, but very useful in high biomass regions where NDVI can become saturated. So the EVI is really useful for use in places like the Amazon. And there are also product, standard products available, so you don't actually have to do this analysis on your own. Um, there are products available from MODIS, 
that are generated every 16 days at 250 meters spatial resolution. Um, and the, they use an algorithm to select the best available pixels that um, don't include things like clouds that can affect this um, calculation. They're available in a variety of places, and I've listed some of the data portals here that you can obtain these data. VIRS also has similar vegetation indices um, with the NDVI, EVI, and an EVI2, which is a newer um, EVI algorithm. Again, the best pixel is selected over a 16-day period, and the data um, are available at 500 meters spatial resolution. And it's designed to be very similar to the MODIS product. So we have a nice continuum of um, these data to better understand changes over time. So the leaf area index or the LAI is also another useful parameter in evaluating ecosystems. It's a dimensionless variable and a ratio of the leaf area per unit ground surface area. And it can be related to things like photosynthesis, evaporation, transpiration, rainfall interception, and carbon flux. Um, and it's a key biophysical variable that influences um, things like the energy balance in um, terrestrial ecosystems. So it's really an important piece in identifying structural characteristics of vegetation and vegetation health. So again, we have some products available um, for LAI. There's a MODIS LAI and FPAR product um, available at four and eight day composites at a spatial resolution of 500 meters. Um, and as discussed, the LAI is um, an index that quantifies the one-sided leaf area of a canopy, and then FPAR is the fraction of incoming solar energy absorbed through photosynthesis. Um, so it's another useful parameter. And again, uh, you can access these data at many of these um, portals listed here. Similarly, there, there are VIRS, LAI, and FPAR products. Um, and again, these are intended to align with, MODI, with the MODIS product to provide that long-term consistent um, data source. Primary production, um, another key uh, feature of ecosystems is the rate of organic biomass growth or accumulation by plants. And primary production is commonly split into two components. So gross primary productivity or GPP and net primary productivity or NPP. GPP is the overall rate of biomass production by producers, where NPP is the remaining fraction of biomass produced after accounting for energy loss due to cellular respiration and maintenance of plant tissue. So the NPP is the really important component of the global carbon budget and is used as an indicator of ecosystem function. And it can also be assessed um, on the ground um, by harvesting uh, plant material. So you can have a relationship and um, correlation uh, calculation conducted using the in-situ data on the ground as well as the remotely sensed data here. Um, the NPP is also is often calculated as a product of FPAR, um, which, which we mentioned previously, um, and common inputs to this type of modeling include things like land cover, phenology, and the leaf area index. So again, we have, a, we have products available um, that have done this NPP calculation for you. Um, here is an example of NPP from MODIS. And this product provides annual NPP at 500 meter um, pixel resolution um, for the globe. Uh, and you can access it here again um, at these portals listed. And now I also wanted to mention this um, really great um, newly available um, data set um, focused on forest carbon. So forest carbon um, are essential to understand how much carbon is currently stored in ecosystems and how it changes. So this new um, 
Boreal wide map uses ISAT2, which is um, something we didn't highlight previously, but it's a laser altimeter that produces elevation estimates. And those data were used in combination with Landsat 8 and Copernicus um, digital elevation models to map biomass at 30 meter spatial resolution. And this information was provided here by um, the PI on this project, Laura Duncanson with the University of Maryland. And the higher spatial resolution of 30 meters um, for this, this data product used increases the precision and facilitates fusion with other gridded products that are at 30 meters like Landsat. So you can compare this with land cover maps, for example, you may have produced with, with Landsat. The product um, maps down to 50 degrees north. Um, and so you can explore the map using the biomass earth data dashboard. And uh, we've, pr we've provided a link there to um, explore the map and to access these data. And this is an open science product that was created um, on this open science platform, the multi-mission algorithm and analysis platform. Um, and it was developed by NASA and ESA for collaborative and open science based in the cloud. Um, the platform also hosts um, LIDAR data um, and will also be used for future SAR missions. I mentioned NISAR and biomass as upcoming um, SAR missions to look for in the future, and that'll be a great reference point for those types of data as well. So this is a really fantastic new product if you're interested in the assessment in the boreal regions of the world. So um, now that we've outlined many things, um, we talked initially about uh, ecosystem services and the, the basics of um, services and valuation. We discussed key global frameworks and initiatives that are aimed at actionable steps towards ecosystem accounting. And then we outlined some of the key remote sensing data and products that can be used in these accounts. And while we didn't highlight every single data and product out there, this gives you a really good basis for what's being used in um, ecosystem accounts. And this will be a baseline for the next two sessions. So um, please do stay with us as we then link this information more clearly on the data and products to the questions and themes that are being asked and evaluated within ecosystem accounts. Um, we're really looking forward to being joined by two guest speakers for our next session, Ken Bagstad with the USGS, who will describe the importance of interoperability of data with ARIES. And we will also hear from Becky Chaplin Kramer from Stanford, who will highlight the Natural Capital Project and INVEST. So they will really help us um, connect the dots here and really speak towards models and methods for integrating the data that we talked about and for applying the data for these, these large scale initiatives. Um, and then in the final session, we're really going to sort of bring it home with specific use cases and examples of projects throughout the world that are doing these types of um, economic uh, valuation of ecosystems. So um, this is just the start and I'm really excited for you all to join us um, for our next sessions as well. So as a reminder, um, here's the contact information for myself and my colleague Juan Torres Perez. Here is the um, training web page where you'll be able to download the materials shown here. Um, you'll have access to view the recording after we're done, and then um, also um, access the Q&A document that we will post after we review um, from the, the session that we have right now. Um, we also, as I mentioned throughout the, the training series, we have a lot of trainings available on our set. So um, you can follow us on Twitter to hear about upcoming trainings. You can visit our website for past trainings. Everything is still there, freely available. Um, and you can also learn about our sister programs within um, capacity building at NASA, DEVELOP, and SEVERE. Um, and 
please do uh, continue to follow with us and stay informed. And I just want to thank you all. And we will now move into the Q&A portion of this training. All right. Thank you, everyone. Again, um, please give us a moment as we move into the Q&A document. Um, I want to take a moment to also say thank you um, for everyone attending today, we have over a thousand folks from around the world online with us together. Um, and it's just so fantastic to see such a um, interested and engaged community. And I, um, I hope that this training um, is valuable to you all. Um, I also wanna say, as we have been evaluating some of the questions as they've come in, many, many, many of the questions we hope um, will will be answered throughout this training series. So I know um, you're all eager to get details and um, really talk about diving into the use of um, things like land cover maps for um, economic assessments. And we're going to provide some examples as we move through this series. Um, next week, we'll really be talking about some of the methods and tools and then um, and then in our final session, we'll be um, really talking about case study examples. So hopefully that'll give you some more perspective on the types of variables and data and methodologies to use. Great, so um, we have about 20 minutes here. We'll go through some of the questions um, that we've outlined. Um, and then there are other questions that we will answer offline in this document. And then again, we'll post the document online. So if you don't get your question answered today, um, you can come back and check on the, the website to see if it has been answered um, after this is over. And then you can also follow up with myself or my colleague Juan here. So um, we will jump right in with uh, question one. What are the parameters to be used in assessing the economic ecosystem service valuation of a freshwater wetland? Um, and I will say that um, with these types of questions, we've received questions along the same lines for different types of ecosystems or study regions. And it's really going to be dependent on your local area, what your desired outcomes from the assessment are, and how um, people locally and regionally uh, value these kinds of services. Um, with things like wetlands, um, one area you might be interested in examining are um, outlining the wetland extent and the change in wetlands over time. And so we talked about land cover mapping. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later in session. Wetlands are also um, really great at providing protection from floods, as well as providing um, filtering to improve water quality. So. Um, for maybe a coastal wetland, um, you might be able to assess the potential economic loss to infrastructure, things like homes, businesses, roads, if the wetlands weren't present. And we actually have a great example um, in a similar capacity on the um, coral reefs and their ability to provide protection against um, coastal flooding in session three. Also, you could evaluate something like say the cost of building a water treatment facility that would provide the same kind of filtering um, to improve water quality as the wetlands may provide. So that might be another example of how um, you could evaluate what the cost of building that treatment facility would be versus um, what those wetlands provide in their natural state. Um, so those are a few examples. And again, um, we'll, we'll get to more throughout the series. Um, there's also a really great uh, um, paper here, uh, actually a whole book, I believe, on um, evaluating um, ecosystem services of wetlands in 2015. So I'm sure that will provide you with some um, additional variables that could be analyzed for this type of ecosystem. Okay, um, going on to question two. Does SIA offer any free materials or tools for natural capital accounting? The answer is resoundingly yes. They have a ton of resources on their website. Um, these include things like um, trainings that are much more extensive than the training we will provide. They also have data that is shared amongst 
countries and researchers globally, and they also have methodologies for outlining natural capital accounting. On the website, they also mention the ARIES platform, and we're, we're going to be joined by um, Ken Dagstad from the USGS, who will provide an overview of that platform and discuss how data can be shared and really talk about interoperability of data across many um, different ecosystems, data types, um, users. Um, and so that's a great resource that is also linked to that um, UNCA website that I mentioned. Um, and then the final thing I will mention very briefly is we're going to hear um, from Becky Chaplin Kramer in the next session about the invest tool um, and the natural capital project. And that is another great resource for um, completing these types of um, accounting assessments. Okay, question three, do you have examples of these ecosystem service valuations um, that use valuation methods other than dollars? Um, we will provide many examples through, throughout the course, so stay tuned. Um, I will say that many of these examples do focus on that economic valuation. However, other metrics that can be included are things like the value of biodiversity, habitat extent, aesthetic value, recreational activities, um, and even things like the positive impact of the environment on mental health. So there are many other variables that you can evaluate that are non-monetary um, within the um, ecosystem service valuation system. Okay, question four. Does the CIEA framework take into account demand for ecosystem services or only supply? And then a similar question here, can CIEA be contacted to get help um, for this type of accounting? So within the framework, I will say that um, much of what can be done here is really in terms of what the objectives of the study are, um, the uh, regional approaches, um, the differences in ecosystems and um, the way the services are used and valued. So you certainly can take into account demand for the services um, and However, I will say that the EA framework really focuses on the contributions of the ecosystem to economic activity. So it's really evaluating, um, in a sense, the, the physical pieces that can be used for the supply of services, so the flow of those stocks through the economic um, system. And that is, again, really where the satellite remote sensing, you know, the key to where we're bringing it all together here with this course, plays the, the most important role in its supply. Um, and then there are certainly other data sets that can be used to assess the demand of those services um, that are generally not related to the remote sensing aspect as well. Um, so I will say that the physical supply or stock is really the central piece to that EA framework that we talked about. Um, and then in regards to uh, sort of that follow on, um, SIA does have a website for frequently asked questions as well as a contact link provided on the website as well. And if you, if you go to their website, you'll see they have a lot of resources that can um, help you in conducting these assessments. Okay, so question five. Um, what data quality standards have been developed internationally so that users can assess the uncertainty of data products for application to their particular use? Uh, that's a great question. And within SIA, there are a set of agreed upon standard concept, definitions, accounting rules, um, and you can get much more information about those standards within um, the documents on the central framework, the ecosystem accounts, and the application. Um, and I will also give another plug for the ARIES platform. We'll talk about um, how to um, use data across different systems, and that also relates to um, assessing um, uncertainties um, in different data props product for their application and use. Okay, so question six. Is there any plan in the future that the Group on Earth Observation is expanding their program to Southeast Asia? Are forest geo and marine geo part of this work? Um, so geo is a global network. Um, they have, I believe, over 100 member countries from around the world, and there are multiple countries within Southeast Asia that are participating in these efforts. Um, 
So I've provided the link where you can see the country um, network map there. And then um, I do believe that Forest Geo and Marine Geo are part of those efforts. They actually have a whole suite of um, flagship efforts for Geo included in their Geo work program. So if you go to the second link I provided here, you can see all of these different initiatives um, and what they're doing globally. So the, the, the GEO is not just um, related to ecosystem accounting or ecosystem services. It's, it's really to increase the use of Earth observations for a variety of applications globally um, for better understanding our Earth system as a whole. Um, so some of these efforts go beyond the scope of ecosystem services, but um, much of it is related as well. That's a good question. Okay, uh, moving on to question seven. What are the standard indicators or variables to assess the impact of climate change on different ecosystems, specifically mountain and estuarine, um, and how are they related to human and local well-being? Um, it's sort of about halfway through the um, presentation for today. We did talk about um, some of the variables that can be used in different ecosystems. Um, in particular, as it relates to climate change, changes in temperature and precipitation are huge to assess um, what's going on in these ecosystems and how their services may be degraded um, by the impacts of climate change. Uh, we also mentioned things like canopy structure, woody biomass, um, changes to watershed. So this could include impacts of fire um, and sedimentation loading um, related to water quality issues. Um, you could assess things like desertification due to extended and more severe drought. Um, there are a variety of um, variables that you can use to assess the impact of climate change. And again, it really depends on your system, uh, what your objectives are, what, um, what type of variables may be impacting your ecosystem the most. Um, and then I also wanted to mention in session three, we will pr be providing an example of um, urban heat islands and the positive impact of uh, trees in, um, in urban areas for, for mitigating the effects of um, increased heat due to climate change. I know that's not a mountain or estuarine um, environment, but that's another example of how um, those things can uh, be used to relate to human well-being. I'm going to skip question eight. I'm not sure I quite understand it. Um, the question is, which of these satellite products produce data cubes with the whole wavelength integrated? Um, if you'd like to provide a bit more detail on what you mean with that question, I can, we can try to add it to the list later on and follow up with that. Uh, apologies there. Okay, question nine. I heard that economic value is based on scarcity. Not sure if it's true, but here I see that valuation is actually what is there. So which value should I take into account? The actual ES or the value based on, on the economic sense? So, I think what this question is really getting at is how we link the physical to the economic. And this can be done in a variety of ways. Um, again, we're really focusing on how we um, assess the physical components of the system as they relate to the use of Earth observations to evaluate those things. But again, this will depend on the region, how things are valued in local, regional, and global systems. So scarcity certainly can be a factor in how the economic supply chain is valuing some kind of service. So when we think about um, food, food that we provide um, via our ecosystems, that can be clearly tracked in the economy. And if a food item is scarce, um, we're all seeing our food uh, prices go up um, in the US certainly, um, that can play a role in how that specific item is valued in the economic supply chain. So um, that is certainly something to take into account when you're doing the actual monetary assessment. Um, we won't go into a lot of detail um, along those lines in this training series, but that's certainly something to, um, to think about in how that service is valued monetarily in the economic supply chain. Um, and we will have some specific examples 
um, uh, about that later on in the series as well. Okay. Question 10, are these satellites available and functional in any region of the country? So most of the satellites that we mentioned here, um, such as Landsat, MODIS, VIRS, et cetera, have worldwide coverage. Um, every satellite system is going to have differences in terms of their, their spatial resolution, their temporal resolution, so how often they're flying over the same place on Earth. We did mention a few systems um, that are um, only available in specific regions. Um, we talked about hyperspectral data. Most of those kinds of data are available um, via airborne flights that are occurring in specific regions. Um, but we really focus here on the global data sets available um, that can be used in any place in the world. Um, I will also say that um, if you're in a very cloudy region of the world, such as the tropics, optical remote sensing might not be your best choice um, as clouds can skew the um, data that we get for ground um, analyses. So um, something like SAR data might be of use, use if you are in a region like that. Um, the question 11 asks what the EC and ENCA approach is. So this I believe is just another way for um, another acronym for na natural capital accounting. Um, I, I found it by um, looking at the UK system for um, for guidance on natural capital accounting. So um, it's very similar to the approaches that we've outlined here, and in many ways links to what we have um, discussed. So essentially, a guidance for um, policy and decision makers to consider natural capital accounting and valuation in um, their um, economic activities. Okay, we'll get through a couple more questions here. The next question, what is the most powerful satellite for identifying dense vegetation and detecting land surface temperature anomalies for the present day? That's a really good question, and it depends on a variety of things. So we mentioned um, the NDVI and the EVI as vegetation indices. The EVI is much more powerful in densely vegetated regions like the Amazon because the NDVI can um, become oversaturated. So in really dense regions, the NDVI will sort of max out at a, at a high NDVI value and the, the EVI is, um, much more susceptible to identifying changes in dense regions. Um, so the, the NDVI and EVI can be calculated using MODIS, VIRS, and Landsat. So those are um, you know, different sensors um, that can be used to evaluate those things. Uh, in terms of, you know, the other thing I will mention is in dense, forest regions, you might be really interested in identi identifying things like canopy structure, woody biomass, um, clumping of trees. And in those, um, in, in order to better understand those variables, you would probably in be interested in synthetic aperture radar or LIDAR data. Um, and we've mentioned that briefly in this um, training series, but it's very different from optical data. and. Our set has many, many trainings on the use of SAR data. So that can be really useful um, depending on you know, what you're really interested in evaluating in that dense forest ecosystem. Um, and, then, and then in terms of land surface temperature anomalies, um, that also will depend on the, um, the temporal nature of your question. So for example, if you're really interested in wildfires, um, i.e. You know, hot spot detection, you could use things like MODIS and VIRS on a daily basis to identify temperature anomalies. Um, if you're interested in evaluating um, changes to um, heat over um, an urban area or even in a, um, wa a river system, you could use things like Landsat if you're not really um, requiring daily revisit times 
um, over the same region. So if you're interested in evaluating changes in temperature, but you can um, you can use data on um, eight day basis every eight days where you're getting an image over that region. And again, um, it's important to think about spatial resolution and trade offs um, for these different um, satellite systems. So it really depends on what the question is, um, your uh, study area um, and your uh, ability to you know, uh, think about those trade offs. Okay, um, we are right at time, so I will answer one more question here. And then, um, as you can see, we have some other questions cataloged that we will answer um, by uh, via typing in the answer here and then posting these to the website. Um, this question relates to, is there a tool for oceans or marine systems? Um, and big thanks to my colleague Juan, um, who is our uh, marine and coastal expert here for adding in um, some information here. And the data are much more scarce for oceans and marine ecosystems. Um, and the same applies to valuation of marine ecosystems, whether it's region specific or country specific. Um, we will be providing an example, as I mentioned in session three, on the valuation of coral reefs for um, ecosystems in um, Hawaii, Florida, and Puerto Rico, um, and evaluating coastal risk reduction. And that's a really important um, resource. And there is a link there to um, a paper that talks about the challenges of assessing marine ecosystem services. Um, and then there's also a link to the Marine Geo Portal, um, which was mentioned earlier as well. So those are some nice resources for assessing those types of systems. Um, so stay tuned. Um, a lot of my answers to these questions have been stay tuned. <laughs> so do please join us on, um, on Thursday of this week and then um, for session three, which will um, have um, a week from today as well. So um, thank you all again for joining us. Um, so many folks from around the world. I hope that this session was valuable to you and I hope that you join us um, for our next session. So thanks again and do take care.